Hi, everyone, and welcome to another Jacobin Talk. Uh, my name is Boss Kristen Carr. I'm the editor and publisher of Jacobin, and I'm the host a few days a week of Jacobin Talks. Again, not the most original title, but you know, it's it's what we came up with. And we've been um, broadcasting with a left-wing thinker who's been talking about an issue, or we've been, we've been occasionally having debates for around 30, 35 minutes at 6 p.m. on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And then in addition to that on this channel, we've been uh, hosting uh, the weekend's show, which broadcasts at 1 p.m. Eastern. And uh, this Saturday, we have Amber Frost joining Anna and Mando. Amber is going to be talking about her really impressive review essay in the new edition of Catalyst. So you might know Amber as a incredible broadcaster, a provocateur, someone who's, uh, you know, everybody loves on, on Chapo. Uh, well, 90% of people love, mostly our audience loves her. I mean, there's 10% of uh, haters online, but she actually, uh, you know, is an incredible writer as well. And she, uh, went through the process of writing a review essay in our peer-reviewed journal, Catalyst. Uh, unlike other peer-reviewed journals, this one's actually affordable. If you get a subscription for $20 a year, uh, Amber's article is also not paywalled. So you could just go to catalyst-journal.com and check it out. And um, on Monday, shoot, Kale, who do we have on Monday? Do we have a slide for Monday? I, I don't know who we who we have on 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 Monday, but we're broadcasting on Monday. Um, we, have our, we have our good friend Hadas. Oh, Hadass we have Hadas on Monday. Okay, yeah. so, yes. I don't so we have actually it. Jacqueline Stafford <laughs> on Monday. Hadas, who just wrote a, a book for um, uh, for um, Haymarket Books, is going to be talking about how mainstream economics uh, hides class relations. Then on Wednesday. We actually have an interview with Thomas uh, Frank. He'll be talking about the recent history of anti-populism and the American history of populism. Um, I've been told I'm going to keep the intro under, I should keep the intro under nine minutes and 40 seconds this time. I don't know. My intro length really just depends on when the NBA game starts. So if you look back and correlate Jacobin Talks with the 6.30 p.m. Uh, NBA starts, um, you'll find like very abrupt endings, like me rushing guests and us wrapping up at six six 6.45 on the dot. Today, the game starts at 9 p.m. So this intro is gonna go on and on and on. Um, so anyway, press like and press subscribe. Those are only asked for this channel. Uh, Jack had been on Wednesday, just turned 10 years old. We wanna last another 10 years. And we do that by building up our audience and with your help, uh, especially on this channel. You know, we only have 42,000 subscribers. Uh, we would like to get to at least 60 by the end of the year. So please press like, press subscribe. All right. Now, without further ado, and due to popular demand, I want to introduce Stephanie Luce, who's a professor of labor studies, the School of Labor and Urban Studies. Um, and, um, you know, she's someone who's written quite a bit for Jacobin in the past. Uh, we tend to rely on a lot of the uh, good professors at CUNY, the City University of New York, because they have a, a long legacy of being politically committed and really involved with um, both labor part, uh, politics and other kind of left wing activism in the city and have been some of the earliest supporters of, of Jacobin, including Stephanie, who's started writing for us when we were much smaller. Um, and she's the author of, of several books you might have um, heard about. One is uh, Fighting for a Living Wage. Um, she's also um, the author of, a, I guess her most recent book is Labor Movement, uh, Global Perspectives. Uh, so today, Stephanie is going to be uh, talking about full employment, um, about the political aspects of a, a jobs guarantee, some of the history of activism around there. Obviously, um, there's 
maybe I'm mischaracterizing it, but there's been a more of an emphasis in recent years than left on a universal basic income as a demand. Uh, I think there's plenty of merits to a lot of those uh, proposals as well. I think there's without a doubt a merit to proposals to give people wages for engaging in care work and other socially necessary um, um, work outside the workplace. But there's something really particular about um, demands for, for jobs for all and about the politics of full employment that creates solidarity between the employed and unemployed, I think, in a way that has really been the linchpin of the labor movement at its best uh, for, for many, many uh, decades. And uh, Stephanie's going to talk about some of that history and more, and she'll talk for around 25, 30 minutes or so, or as long as you want, Stephanie. And then after that, we're going to do a Q&A. So if you have any questions, please log in and leave your questions during the, the talk. But uh, thank you for joining us, and uh, go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay, thanks so much, Bhaskar, and happy birthday to Jacobin. So uh, I'm happy to have been part of that uh, history. So, um, okay, so we're going to talk about full employment tonight. And I just want to start out by saying there's a number of ways to define full employment. So obviously, if you're a worker who doesn't have a job or you have a job but not enough hours, um, employment means one thing to you. It's devastating. It's um, financially devastating, emotionally devastating. Um, and in this country where we have so little support uh, for people without work, um, and in fact, we often blame people for being out of work. We blame unemployed people and often say it's their fault that they don't have a job. So employment means, full employment means one thing in terms of how workers and the working class thinks about it. Um, but that is not the same as, quite the same as how the federal government thinks about it, how we think about it in terms of policy. Um, we've often um, thought about it in terms of what we can do collectively as a society to uh, address economic issues and social issues. And then third is the way that employers think about uh, and economists think about full employment. Um, and so for the economy as a whole, uh, unemployment is not such a great thing. But in fact, for capitalism, uh, unemployment is a necessary feature, right? So capitalism works by getting workers to compete against one another. Um, and by doing so, workers keep, you know, driving down wages, or they're willing to accept lower wages, or they're willing to accept worse conditions. And in fact, they may begin to see one another as enemies. They see each other as competition. Um, and one of the ways that racial capitalism survives is by dividing workers by race and by ethnicity. Um, and uh, unemployment is one way that that happens. Um, so that's why this topic is so important politically. Um, and that's why we want to get into the details of how the term full unemployment is used, how workers, governments, and uh, in economists think about it. Um, so. Uh, employers, you can see, actually, if we go back to the 1920s, um, uh, a prominent business person, uh, Samuel Insull, said, the best guarantee of, of efficiency is a long line at the factory gate. So that gives you uh, a sense of how employers think about unemployment as being beneficial to an individual employer, but it's also beneficial to capitalism as a whole. Okay, so let's get into the details. And I'm going to start first by talking about full employment as policy. So this idea that everyone should have a job has been popular uh, for a long time um, and in different points in history, but it really became popular in the 1930s during the Great Depression when we had massive unemployment. And you know it was seen as a negative for the economy overall. Um, you know when we have high unemployment, uh, people are not able to buy goods and services, they're not able to pay their taxes, and the economy really stalls out. So with that in mind, the federal government established some federal jobs programs um, to put people to work directly for the federal government. Things like the Works Progress Administration and the Civilian Conservation Corps um, and other programs like that, where the government hired people to do socially necessary work and to get the economy up and running again. Um, and then coming out of World War II, uh, Congress passed um, the Employment Act in 1946. Now, the initial goal was that the federal government would be the employer of people, of, of workers, but that didn't pass. 
a watered down version passed, but it still said this, that the federal government has a responsibility to coordinate and utilize all its plans, functions, and resources to foster conditions under which there will be afforded useful employment for those able, willing, and seeking to work. So in other words, it calls on the federal government to pursue full employment. Um, and it did that to some extent in the years following uh, World War II, following the act, though primarily focusing on white men. Um, but it, it maintains some commitment to trying to find employment uh, for, for workers. Then we hit the 1970s, we hit another global recession, uh, unemployment goes up, the economy stalls out. And in 1978, Congress passes the uh, Humphrey Hawkins Act, um, also known as the Full Employment and Balanced Growth Act. So that act um, now calls on the federal government to pay attention to full employment, but it must balance it with uh, four ultimate goals. So that includes full employment, but that must be balanced with productivity growth, price stability, and balance of trade and budget. Um, and again, the initial proposal would have been for full employment, uh, for federal uh for the federal government to provide full employment, that didn't pass. What passed instead sounds good in theory, but what it actually did was to transfer responsibility for full employment from our elected uh, federal government, from our legislators, to the Federal Reserve. So now we have the Federal Reserve, bankers, and economists who are in charge of determining the society's commitment to full employment. Okay, so that makes us ask, if economists are now in charge of determining full employment, how do economists think about full employment? So first of all, what's important, we, we should acknowledge that there's always gonna be some people who don't want to work. So no one's uh, mandating, I think in this case, mandatory employment. So, so we have to have space for voluntary unemployment. People who are in school, people who, um, are, uh, you know, uh, want to retire, uh, you know, people who have other means to do something else. Um, and economists refer to these uh, people as the voluntary unemployed. Um, and the trick about that is sometimes we see people who are so-called voluntary unemployed who actually do want to work, but they don't have access to childcare, they don't have access to transportation. Um, so that's something that we want to talk about later. Um, but there are a lot of questions about who actually is voluntarily unemployed, just as I would say, is anyone voluntarily employed, right, in a society with no safety net and when you have to have a job to get health care just to survive, whatever, we don't even know that we have voluntary employment, let alone unemployment. But from the perspective of The Economist, we have voluntary unemployed and then we have involuntary unemployed. And this is the area that economists tend to focus on the most, the involuntarily unemployed, people who want to work but cannot find it. So they distinguish between four kinds. The first is seasonal unemployment. That could be people who beach lifeguards, farm work, um, Santa Claus at the mall. Um, the second category is what we call cyclical unemployment. And that comes with the cycles of the economy. So when we're in the recession, like right now, lots of restaurant workers, hotel workers are out of work. The theory being that once the economy picks back up, they'll be back employed. The third category refers to the unemployment that happens when the economy begins to really shift, when there are old industries that die out, old occupations that are no longer needed, like switchboard operator, or new industries that are emerging where we don't yet have workers with skills. And the last category is what is called frictional unemployment. And this is the idea that there's always gonna be someone who's out of work because they're moving to another state, they're left, they've left New York City to go upstate, um, or someone new to the labor market, someone looking for a better job. So these are the four categories that uh, economists mostly focus on in terms of what they call um, uh, involuntary unemployment. So given that, they say we're always going to have people who are unemployed. There's never going to be zero unemployment. So they talk about something called the natural rate of unemployment, right? So if it can't be zero, what is it? Is it 1%? Is it 2%? Um, when they call it a natural rate, it makes it sound like it's just a technical detail that you just need to plug in a formula. But in fact, it's a very political decision. Um, and one of the main uh, 
factors that they use to determine what they call the natural rate of employment. Unemployment uh, is inflation. Okay, so inflation is very important to economists. And the theory is that if unemployment goes too low, workers will now have a lot more confidence. They'll have power to demand higher wages. Um, if everyone's employed, then a worker can just say, hey, you need me, you need workers to run, so pay me more money or treat me better, or I'm gonna form a union and you can't stop me. So um, the fear that economists have in the theory, the theory um, says that if unemployment goes too low, workers will demand and get higher wages, and then the employer will pass those wages on in the form of higher prices, and then those higher prices will lead to inflation. Okay, so that's the theory. Um, and so that actually connects to um, that what economists actually use the term non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment or the acronym NIRU. Um, and you may hear the word NIRU, but that is what they say the natural rate, and that is they set around five to 6%. And they say, if it, employment goes below five or 6%, we're gonna get inflation and that's a bad thing. Um, okay, so, there's a, a lot to say about Nairu and these rates, but I want to focus on a few points here. Um, and the first is that this theory about there being a trade-off between unemployment and inflation has been in general disproven over the years. So we've had periods where we've had high uh, inflation and high unemployment, and we've had periods where in like most recently in the last few decades, low inflation and low unemployment. They're not necessarily moving together. Um, and we're seeing un unemployment going low, technical unemployment, official unemployment going low, but wages are not going up. So why is that? What's happening? Um, so first of all, is just because unemployment is low doesn't mean workers have more power. And that was the slide that we just saw a little bit earlier, but it, workers also need the power to demand the higher wages. Um, unions have been decimated in recent years, uh, so they're not really capable in many places to demand the higher wages and win the higher wages for workers. And also there are a lot more threats or competition. So a worker may think, okay, uh, you know, here unemployment is low, but they know that there's all kinds of uh, people who are actually underemployed, who need a job or who discourage workers who would step back in or workers in other countries. There's a massive power imbalance Employers can at any time just take those jobs and move them to another city, to another state, to another country. They don't even have to actually do it. They just have to threaten to do it. And that threat effect and that power is one of the reasons why low unemployment hasn't necessarily translated into higher wages for workers as they don't necessarily have the power to win it. Um, and what's fascinating is you know, a number of mainstream economists, conservative economists, began to observe that and say, what's going on? Why is unemployment low, but we're not seeing higher wages? Oh, it must be that workers don't have enough power. Even there's a cover of the Economist magazine it says if wages are to rise, workers need more bargaining power. Lots of elements in the uh, mainstream economics and business community are recognizing this. Okay, um, second is that even if workers have the power to win higher wages, workers don't set the prices, right? So workers can win the higher wage. The employer then still decides how to cover that cost of that higher wage. They have other options. They can take that cost out of their CEO bonuses. They can take it you know, out of their advertising budget. Um, you know, they can take it out of profits. Um, so it's not just, it's not workers' wages going up that necessarily causes inflation. It's also the piece that employers have to also decide to raise weight, uh, prices. And that doesn't always happen. And in part because one thing we know is um, it also rests on worker productivity. So workers work hard, they produce lots of wealth. Um, and over the last 40 years or so, workers have per been producing tremendous amount of wealth in goods and services um, in the form of labor productivity, and they're not getting paid 
for what they produce. So there's a, this huge gap between worker productivity and hourly compensation. That's a lot of profit there. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of space that could even absorb some of that higher wage before we'd even see inflation. So those are some of the reasons we're not seeing um, wages go up with lower unemployment and certainly not seeing inflation go up. And the other point is just to point out that banks and investors, the financial sector, particularly hates inflation, right? They make money by loaning money now that'll be paid back in the future. If inflation goes up, the value of what they get back in the future is less. So banks, um, uh, investors, uh, you know, lenders lose money with inflation. You know, for workers, most workers owe money. They have debt. So in, in a sense, if there's high, if there's inflation in the future, they have less debt, right? So inflation for a worker is more of a mixed bag, but for the financial sector, inflation is a killer. They just don't want it. And so for the last several decades, the Federal Reserve continues to prioritize keeping inflation low, even if it comes at the expense of um, higher unemployment, which um, you know is a problem. So that means getting back to the general point natural rate of un unemployment there's nothing really natural about it it is political it is class struggle it is a war over uh, these values of how we um, balance our economic need okay so the reality is um we've never really had a capitalist country with full employment um and employers need workers um they prefer that workers compete against one another um, and with real full employment, employers would lose a lot of power. And in fact, the economist Michael Kalecki said that if we in fact had this form of um, full employment, capitalism maybe couldn't survive unless it adopted very stringent authoritarian measures. Capitalists would need to find a way to discipline workers, to keep them in line, to keep them accepting um, lower wages and following managerial orders. And so you know, this just suggests that capitalism may not actually be able to function with full employment in a real sense. Okay, so now let's look at, um, so yeah, the, the moral here is capitalism needs unemployment, right? So it is built into the system, it's part of it, it's not just a technical detail. Um, all right, now we want to talk about how workers, how to think about full employment from a worker perspective, from the working class perspective. Um, and really, I think that's the most important one, obviously, and I think the one we want to use is that anyone who needs to work or anyone who wants to work can get a job at a living wage. Um, you know, particularly in this country with no safety net, um, it's even more important, but I do think we want to talk about safety net and we'll get to that at the end. Um, but with you know tens of millions of people currently unemployed or underemployed or discouraged, um, the time is really ripe to be to be talking about what would a full employment policy look like. So just uh, a few things quickly is uh, that countries have done over the years. Um, one strategy has been the idea of shorter work weeks. So. Um, you know, even the United States, one of the things we also did in the 1940s was to establish a 40 hour work week. That would be the idea was like, let's share the work rather than people doing um, 80 hours a week. Let's try and create more jobs by cutting hours. And that could take different forms. It could be job sharing, cutting overtime, phased in retirement. Um, if you have free college, free higher ed, in a sense, that's job sharing because it delays people going into the labor market. Um, so a number of things like that. So some European countries, um, you know, have experimenting more so with cutting back to the 35 hour work week and, and so forth. You know, and what the research shows is that these can be very beneficial for workers. It's good for balancing jobs and non-work life, um, but they're not the best in terms of job creation. Um, we just don't see a lot of evidence. And that's in part because employers tend to force the remaining workers to pick up the slack or the work doesn't necessarily get done. And really the, the issue here is that we're not gonna solve the jobs crisis by rationing work. Um, really what we need is much more radical interventions to restructure how work is done. So I'm all for shorter work weeks, but I don't think on its own, that's going to deal with what we need to deal with. The second solution that has been proposed over time has been variations of employer subsidies. 
And this is um, giving money to employers directly in order to hire more people or subsidizing low wages. In the United States, we have the earned income tax credit. And that's a, a way to let employers say, OK, you can hire a bunch more people at low wages and the federal government will make up the gap through their taxes. Um, again, something like the earned income tax credit is beneficial to workers, but it is a subsidy to low wage employers. It lets Walmart continue to pay low wages um, and it doesn't really create jobs. There's very little evidence to show that this is a real job creation strategy. So the third proposal and the main one is really the government as the direct employer. And this is, as we saw in uh, the examples in the, um, in the depression, um, the, the, the photo there is from the Civilian Conservation Corps. Um, we had lots of programs then, even recently in the 1970s, San Francisco, for example, put paid workers directly, artists directly to create public art. I think New York City did as well. Um, other countries have uh, developed, India uh, has versions of hiring people directly to do work. Um, and so this idea is the idea that the government is the employer of last resort, meaning it still relies on the idea that workers who do have it can get jobs in the private sector, but those who don't can go to the government and get a job at a living wage and that anyone who wants it would be able to do so. Now, again, it, it doesn't necessarily address some of those questions I raised earlier. It doesn't necessarily address if you don't have transportation, if you don't have childcare, um, we still may have unemployment. Um, and so that has to be dealt with. But the proposals that have been recently on the table, you know, we've heard Bernie Sanders campaign, uh, we've heard several economists. Um, one of the main popular ideas right now is um, from Sandy Darity, Derek Hamilton, and Mark Paul, um, who kind of formed the, some of the foundation of the Sanders proposal. Um, and they call for the creation of something that they call the Permanent National Investment Employment Corps. Um, and that would be the entity that would provide a job for anyone um, who wanted one. Um, their proposal says that those jobs would be either full-time, which would be 35 to 40 hours a week, or you could also get a part-time job at 20 hours a week. Um, the full-time job would come with health benefits. Um, their proposal doesn't include health for the part-time. Um, and their proposal uh, sets a minimum wage, a, a base wage of an hourly wage that would meet the federal poverty line. So roughly 11.83 might be up to $12 an hour now, but reaching about 24,000 or so uh, a year, the poverty line for a family of four. Um, and that would be the base, but wages could go up higher depending on skills and um, other factors. Um, and so that's one proposal, right? So, um, and they give lots of details on that. It would be administered through the Department of Labor, but it would go through states and cities. Um, the states and cities would work with unions and community organizations and civilian groups to, to, to say, what are our needs in this community? We need more uh, childcare, home health aids. We need people to work on uh, reconstruct uh, uh, infrastructure, construction jobs, um, Green New Deal jobs, we could put people back to work in the arts, um, musicians, and so forth. Um, you know, that idea is that communities would decide what kind of work they needed. And at the same time, there would also be federal government oversight to see which areas of our economy need investment, such as in infrastructure and so forth. Um, and they have lots of details about how it would be uh, monitored, um, a Department of uh, Progress investigation, to look for corruption and um, really trying to, you know, think out the details based on what we've learned from prior experiences with federal programs. Okay, so I just want to say I think there are a lot of exciting benefits of this model and variations of it. Um, it could really eliminate involuntary unemployment. I don't think just as it is. You know, we still need to talk about some other of the social programs. Um, but it could really make a serious dent in involuntary un unemployment. And it could really uh, eliminate working poverty because in this model, everyone who needs uh, the job would at least get a job that would reach the federal po poverty line. Now, of course, there's issues on that too, like the poverty line doesn't differ by city and so forth. So wage in New York City might not be the same as a wage in Buffalo, but the goal would be 
towards moving towards eliminating working poverty. Um, and really one of the big benefits here is that we are talking about providing a workforce to do so much of the work that we need done in our society right now, from care work um, to environmental work, to saving our national parks and state parks, to running our libraries. You know, the idea is not to displace people already doing that work. This would just be supplementing the people that are already there. But there's massive holes and uh, lots of work needs to be done. So economists say we can pay for a lot of this also because once you eliminate working poverty, you're also saving on unemployment insurance, you're saving on some of the social programs that people rely on. Okay, so there's lots of benefits. One thing, you know, a couple of things for concerns to think about is, you know, we wanna think about um, the barriers that still exist to finding work that might not be solved by this. And we still wanna look at ways to make life more affordable so people aren't reliant on a wage. So if we had real affordable housing, if we had free higher ed and free healthcare, free childcare, all of those things would mean that we are less dependent on a wage and the wage level isn't as important. So a jobs program can't come at the expense of ignoring those other demands. Um, now, some people worry that this might end to just make work and be you know, productivist to say you have to work in order to survive. Um, and that is a concern. We want to think about that. We don't want people just doing drudge work. That's happened under many right-wing policies, you know, welfare to work programs and so forth. The idea is that this should be socially necessary work and the work should be rewarding. One of the things in the proposal I talked about earlier is you would get time, at least a day, a, a month off work to research other jobs, to do job training, to move into other areas. Um, so the focus has to be also on work that's rewarding. Um, and then I think really one thing we have to put center here is social reproductive work. Uh, how does social reproductive labor fit into this model? Now, some states um, currently pay family members who are taking care of um, elderly uh, uh, and sick um, family members, right? So they get paid to do that care work. Um, so the idea is, could we also expand the federal jobs to do some of that care work and also to cover child care work? You know, we also could expand it so that care workers are getting a fair wage to take care of other people's families, but also maybe to take care of their own families. But we have to put that piece um, very central here. And then one other concern I would just say is like, I don't think the 40 hour work week works. It just doesn't work for so many people. It doesn't fit with school schedules. It doesn't fit with life schedules. And, you know, the fear is returning to that model um, rather than going down the path of exploring more flexible models. And I think we want to keep that open as well, because the standard work week really never worked for most people. And um, we don't want to, like, romanticize that as the end goal. And finally, just you know, thinking about environmental issues is, you know, people say, hey, if we just focus on more work, more work, more work, uh, let's remember that a lot of that work has environmental impacts. Um, if we're sending people to just drive across, the, you know, the city to take care of other people's families, that seems crazy. So let's do this with the environmental implications in mind. Okay, I would just summarize this uh, to wrap up to say, how do we evaluate? Um, I think that we should see a federal jobs program, you know, not as a complete solution in itself, but in conjunction with other demands um, that would make people less dependent on wage labor altogether. Um, but, um, and, and we really wanna be aiming this towards people surviving, not just reaching the poverty line, but using social goods along with this to really have a, a living wage or living income. Um, but we need to pay close attention to how it's framed. You know, it's not just that we're looking for people to work to order to, in order to survive. We're looking to frame this as a way that jobs, in a sense, liberate us from the wage labor market. The, it could be a, a counterpose to capitalism. You know, and the right to the right to a job has been framed as a component of a freedom struggle, uh, along with civil rights, for many decades. So, you know, starting out of um, Reconstruction up to the March on Washington. Um, so we want to think of jobs in this way, as jobs as liberating, jobs as freedom, not as jobs as, you know, uh, 
as tying us down. Um, and I think, you know, we also finally we want to fight for full employment because unemployment serves such a powerful force in capitalism. Um, it serves to divide workers. It keeps us separated. It serves to put fear into workers and um, to discipline us. Um, so capitalists will not allow full employment without a real fight. And in fact, many are already trying to reduce the federal commitment to that, the little commitment that we already have. So I think for me, I see the fight for full employment as actually part of a package of non-reformist reforms. Um, I don't think capitalism can exist with full employment. And I think we need to see um, the demand as a part of a demand for us to understand the world as a collective project, where we all have a role to play in feeding and clothing and making our world a collective space that we should all be able to live and find a way to, to do that for, for providing for the collective good. Um, so that's it, so thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, um, uh, Stephanie, that was great. So if anyone has questions, please do put them in the, in the chat. And I, I re really like the way that you, you ended, I guess, pushing against this idea of um, that it would be um, make work because full employment is really just a state in which a demand for labor matches supply. So if, for example, we're in such a state and we have more working class power and there's a labor saving technology, there's automation, um, instead of it causing us to lose jobs and have more unemployment, it just means we share in the results of those productivity gains. We could reduce hours. We can maybe tweak our labor techniques so that we're um, at old levels of efficiency, but it's it's more bearable for people and, and, and things like that. It opens up a whole um, array of, of choices. Um, I think one thing you get at too is that these choices are easier to imagine in a world in which even if there is a competitive market economy, there's worker-owned firms in some way. Because you could imagine a worker owner making a different trade-off than uh, a capitalist for, for which, you know, why would they invest in this labor-saving technology to begin with if it if it if they didn't get the line shares of the, the you know, the proceeds um, to it um, um, and so on. But I guess when we talk about a job guarantee, often we have two different visions. One is this much more far reaching um, transitional program of a jobs guarantee and route to an economy and a society that's much more democratic, that's driven by the, the needs of working people, you know, a socialist economy. Uh, then the other is um, a jobs guarantee as alleviating um, hardship and difficulty in a very short-term way in this in this system. So I guess, would you support a jobs guarantee that was more like a temporary measure that let's say is more akin to some sort of like active labor market policies where the state is the employer of last resort? And yes, you do get a job with a living wage, but it's really just to uh, retrain you and to just wait until um, the sector that and call a new sector emerges that can yeah. absorb your labor. Right, that right. Makes so sense. I think it really has to be seen as this full time permanent uh, program in which workers are going into these jobs uh, and they may stay in these jobs forever. So they're not make work jobs. They're not just uh, mindless tasks, but they are meaningful jobs that, um, you know, that are contributing to society. And so I think, yeah, really um, the emphasis on job training, I think, um, is really uh, a problem. In fact, one of the big uh, shifts in our full employment project uh, or commitment, um, there's a great book by Gordon Lafer called The Job Training Charade. And he actually makes the argument that in the 80s, we've shifted from a federal commitment to job, uh, to providing jobs, to a federal commitment to job training. And so, so much of our rhetoric and policy has been shifted towards saying, okay, we're just there to like provide services to train so that you can go out and get something better. What I support is the idea of a federal jobs program that might provide training and education, but you're paid to do that. And it might still be that you maintain uh, your job in the federal Pro, uh, programs, right? So you may, it may be a way to go into a different job within the federal program. But, um, you know, I think our goal here, again, is just thinking about how do we increase our power 
as workers in the workplace to make it a safer workplace for everybody and a more rewarding job for everybody and also more valuable for society. Yeah, so, but, yeah. yeah, so I was going to say, I guess I, I completely agree with you. So I'm kind of playing <laughs> devil's advocate a bit, but there is a, there is a bit in our vision, uh, not to speak for you as well, but we're advocating the politics of, of full employment. We're advocating a jobs guarantee as a measure to, in a sense, decommodify labor by providing more more jobs, right? Whereas there are, um, like one question in, in the chat is that there are louder and louder segments of the left at, uh, advocating um, a UBI as part of a, a anti-work politics and as a much more direct route to the end of um, wage labor, if you, if you will, and and obviously connected to that, um, some people in the chat are mentioning, you know, automation. So there's the idea that, um, you know, providing a um, uh, full employment is a regressive goal because automation is reducing our need for workers anyway, and it's it's much better to maybe um, instead of trying to recreate those jobs to um, uh, just set up a universal basic income and and figure it out from there. So um, hopefully for people in the chat, I'm giving the best representation of that that argument, but I'm just curious your your thoughts. I know it's a very big, big topic. Sure, well, I, yeah, I love the technology uh, discussion because I don't think we should ever give up. We shouldn't cede that techno technology is just gonna win, automation is gonna win. I mean, workers have been fighting against um, automation since capitalism began. That's just one of the tools that employers always use to try and um, get rid of labor or get more power over workers. And I think we want to embrace that technology can be really great for us. I, you know, I, I often think of uh, my family members. My uncle was a toll taker on the Golden Gate Bridge. That's a job where a lot of people die of lung cancer, right? They're breathing in car fumes all day. And when the easy pass concept comes in, like on the one hand, we feel like we should fight it because it cuts jobs. But on the other hand, you know, he and his coworkers, they get cancer and die, right? Uh, my other uncle was uh, worked in a grocery store and got repetitive uh, motion from doing the, the groceries across the scanner the whole time. And so there's ways in which, you know, again, self-checkout, I don't know, is that better or worse, but we want technology to make jobs safer for workers. We want to embrace that. And we also want technology to make products more accessible for consumers, right? There's lots about Amazon that sucks, but we also know that there are people that can't get out from themselves and technology can make things you know, more accessible in certain ways. We're learning that right now with Zoom, which is that um, in-person teaching is far better, but it allows certain people that can't leave their house access to you know, events like this. So anyways, my point is let's embrace technological change. But if we have a federal jobs program, then that takes away the fear that workers lose the job. True, a UBI, a basic income can also address some of that. So I'm not suggesting this is counterposed. I think that um, you know both of these have merit. But what's what's appealing about a federal jobs program is that there is all this work that needs to be done. No, no matter with automation or whatever, we're still going to need to feed ourselves and take care of one another and play music for one another and um, plant gardens. Like all of that work needs to be done to run society. And let's begin to shift to a system in which we can get people into those kinds of jobs doing social good. And, uh, you know, the UBI can still be part of that. It doesn't necessarily have to be counterposed. Right, absolutely. And it could be decommodified for working class people who are receiving care, for right. example, while those jobs are still being paid unionized jobs. So it's not necessarily like we're just advocating for some sort of, you know, the, the, the decommodification and commodification part is actually in fact, you know, inter intertwined. Um, and obviously the only thing I, it's been quoted so many times and misquoted, it's like now basically apocryphal, but the, the old line that it's um, only thing worse than being exploited uh, by capital is not being exploited by, by, by capital, I think mm -hmm. kind of implies to a lot of people and their, um, and their um, work. So I'm just scrolling through, if you excuse my delay, I'm scrolling through some of these questions. Um, Oh, here's one question. This is something I struggle with as a socialist. There will always be a mismatch between jobs needed and the jobs wanted. How do you square that difference has eluded me. Well, I guess it's more of a question for a um, 
socialist economy. I would say in a socialist economy, um, and or even just in a condition of of um, of full employment, you know, we um, pay people better uh, for certain for certain work. So if you are in a society with even a very expansive welfare state and um, consumers and companies really want people to work midnight shifts at 7-Elevens, um, which used to actually just be from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. That's where they got the name from, but now they're open all the time. Um, you just have to pay them double and triple um, to actually encourage people to work those shifts. Um, and uh, people might be willing to do it, but at a higher price point than they are now. And and same thing with um, a society like sanitation workers. We'll need sanitation workers under social democracy, under socialism, but uh, we might need to pay them as well as nurses and doctors. And actually, they should be in terms of their public health um, impact. Um, but uh, so I think that one is pretty straightforward. Let's see other other questions um on yeah. that, you you could also introduce some job uh, rotations as well on that one. Mm -hmm. it could be that you have to do a, a year um as you know janitorial in the firm before you take on other jobs because you need to learn all aspects of running that company so you know and people would say oh that's inefficient you're not using the skills in the right way but um you know there certainly are models where people have to to learn every aspect of running that business yeah, and also it's not necessarily inefficient if it's done the the right way. Like, first of all, if you allow a, a line worker um, in some sort of more emancipated uh, workplace to take on more managerial or other decisions or to rotate another job, it might increase their length of tenure um, or something like that, and it might that might make up for the for the for the gain. And also, just in general, um, I think people grossly overstate the productivity and efficiency of certain white collar managers. Uh, there's always these studies where people, um, working class people in one study, I think underestimated the amount of hours they worked <laughs> and everyone, both salaried professionals and CEOs and others just overestimated the amount of hours they actually worked in, in, a, in a week. Yeah. Um, so I'm sure there's, there's hours to, to gain. So I would say, my my immediate question is how do we go about pushing this this demand because right now it just seems like very good um rhetoric in other words saying everybody deserves a job in a union saying everybody deserves health care this is rhetoric that probably a majority of americans are already behind and obviously we have a very undemocratic uh political system but let's say if we did have a parliamentary system i don't think we have a majority in parliament behind a Bernie Krat kind of agenda, but I do think we have 30 to 35 percent of the, the vote, as much as any left party around the world, you know, behind this sort of um, uh, agenda. But um, as far as actual implementation, and this is why I wanted to get into some of the history of, of, um, of uh, Humphrey Hawkins' um, uh, full employment bill, is that obviously that had far uh, more modest ambitions but it accomplished far less than even what it was meant to do on paper. You mentioned that the 46th uh, Full Employment um, Act did um, you know, far, far less. And that was from a starting point where there was basically full employment during World War II, if I'm not, I actually don't know that, but this is kind of my popular perception of, of the, the um, employment situation during World War II. So one, how do we go about passing the legislation? And then also, how do we make sure it's actually followed through upon? Because it seems to me a lot more complicated than, let's say, passing Medicare for all legislation that mandates creation of Medicare for all, because this is asking the Fed to do certain things. This is asking state and local authorities to do certain things. I don't want to get in the weeds of like technical implementation, but it seems more complicated. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but it seems more complicated than, than other legislation that we're demanding. Hmm. Um, it's interesting. I'm not sure if I see it being more complicated. I mean, we have the military, we have other models, we have the post office. Um, there are, you know, un underfunded post office and so forth, but we have national employment projects that we have some infrastructure. We can learn from um, 
you know, lots has been written about the 1930s uh, and how it was implemented. Um, and, you know, we know that, sure, it, like if you have a federal program and then it's run through the states and the cities, it's going to vary a lot and it's going to depend on how that state and city is going to pick it up. Um, so that, you know, that is a challenge, um, you know, and the, the I think a lot of the people writing the proposals are building in mechanisms and people are working on how to, you know, enforce and monitor better, uh, in, which includes these um, role for unions and community organizations to be part of the oversight boards, right? So it's like getting a lot of citizen participation in it. And part of that demand is that, you know, this is democratizing the general program itself. Um, but the harder question, I think, to me is how do we get this passed? And that does seem um, like a very far-fetched fetch dream. On the other hand, um, you know, things are in some ways moving fast and, and, and alliances are shifting quickly. You know, just in the last five years or so, more and more employers actually are coming out and uh, conservative economists are coming out saying like we need unions, we need that collective bargaining actually is good for the economy, that we will not get economic growth until we deal with this massive inequality. Um, so people are fishing about for solutions. You know, the libertarian side has often, you know, flirted with the basic income grant as one of the solutions. But I do think um, given the very uh, you know, dangerous situation of the economy that had been stalled out. Economic growth had been stalled out before COVID, right? So this isn't just a COVID phenomenon. Everyone recognizes that we're in trouble. And so I think that alliances could shift weirdly. I mean, just two weeks ago was that initial Jeff Sessions and Marco Rubio coming out saying, you know, hey, Republicans are starting to say that we need to do something about this and unions should should be get, getting a seat at the table. Um, so I think there is space to start talking about instead of massive unemployment, continuing unemployment forever, like let's think about um, another kind of program. Yeah, I guess even uh, American capitalism is probably weaker in a sense for having um, suppressed wage demand so effectively. Um, U.S. auto is weaker than Japanese and, and German auto and other places in part because they didn't have to invest in the same technologies. And, and you know, obviously in Scandinavia, um, collective bargaining agreements pushed up the cost of labor so much that... Um, it ended up being more dynamic, more capital intensive, more innovative than, than a lot of U.S. capital. Though I, I, I highly doubt any individual capitalist will ever get behind that, that program. So just a couple more questions and we'll wrap up. One from Paul is, uh, politically, would it be wise to fight for a state level pilot programs of a job guarantee or should we only fight at the federal level? Um, it's a great question. I mean, I think our bigger challenge at the state level is just the money that we have access to funding at the federal level. We could have deficit spending and, you know, um, you know, so forth. We could, we have more powers to rate, to pay for it at the federal level. If it's possible to pay for it at the state level, you know, um, I think, you know, that would entail things like actual fair taxing, taxing the wealthy billionaire taxes and so forth, um, then yeah, I think it's something exciting to consider. And like I said, San Francisco and New York ex uh, experimented with small programs for artists um, in the 70s. And I think cities could even try something out. So, um, you know, New York City gave uh, money for workers to start worker cooperatives. Um, it was small, a uh, small pilot program, but um, and that's not that's not the same thing as a federal as a jobs guarantee, but you can see that there's space for local experimentation. Right, absolutely. So, thanks so much, Stephanie. I know there's a lot to get into as far as the details of both um, um, inflationary effects of of um, of uh, full employment and maybe debunking um, some of the. Uh, neoclassical dogma about that. Um, I know there's a lot to get into about the actual implementation technically of a program like this, but I think you did a really great job touching a little bit on all the important topics. And for anyone who wants to uh, dive in deeper into this work, we'll throw some links in the uh, description. Um, we have some pieces on the Jackman st site. Um, Stephanie, of course, is a um, contributor to Jackman. Okay, I'll just popped up um, a Mike Beggs article. Mike is one of our 
our most reliable editors. He's based in Australia, though, so I'm not sure you'll ever see him on this program unless he wakes up very, very early. Um, but please do check out Stephanie's work and her, her books. Uh, we'll include links to them. Uh, she also co-wrote uh, a report with Ruth uh, Milkman, another Jackman contributor, on uh, the State of the Union's 2020 uh, which is a profile of organized labor in New York City, New York State, and the United States. Obviously, organized labor is doing a little bit better in New York than it's doing el elsewhere um, in the U.S., but there's some promising um, signs. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks so much. Thank mm -hmm. you.